welcome. I'm so thrilled you all could be here for our final session of Truman by David McCullough. Um, it's been a wonderful 10 months in my book and it's just been amazing to have you all join us. Um, I am Beth, she, her pronouns from book group services here at MCPL and I will be your staff facilitator today. Some best practices for this program are we ask that you stay muted during the presentation. Feel free to put questions in the chat. I will be monitoring. This will be recorded for archival purposes. And for those of you that have uh, checked out physical copies from the Book Talk collection, um, I will go ahead and renew. And then um, you can return those copies whenever is convenient um, in the new year. I'd like to introduce the wonderful Doug Richardson of the National Park Service. Doug is in his 30th year with the National Park Service and has served at eight national parks in four states. Almost 34 years ago, he decided to study history and history education in college, inspired by the writing of David McCullough. He has been at the Truman Home since January 2017 and started developing programs with Mid continent weeks after his arrival. Truman was always his dream park, in part because of the book we are discussing today. He and his wife are staunch believers in the public library system, and yes, his wife made him say that last line. So without further ado, it is all yours, Doug. Thank you, Beth, and hello, my friends. Thank you for being with us today, and thank you for being here for Part 10, the grand finale of our guided tour of Truman, the wonderful biography of Harry Truman by our friend, our late, our great friend, David G. McCullough. I thank you for being with us today. Thank you for being with us through this journey of this biography. This program is brought to you and has been brought to you by our dear friends at Mid-Continent Public Library and the National Park Service, whom I work for, and also in partnership with our dear friends at the National Archives, the Harry S. Truman Presidential Library and Museum. And it dawned on me last night as I was sort of putting the finishing touches on this afternoon's program that I'm not sure I've talked much about the Truman family relationship with Mid-Continent Public Library, and it really ties together with this particular episode of this series. The Truman family very much had a loving relationship with the local libraries. Truman always said that growing up, that he had read every book in the Independence Public Library while he was in grade school. He was very proud of that. And late in life, Mrs. Truman had a very special relationship with the local library. And then when the library rebranded as Mid-Continent Public Library, she had a very special relationship with that library. And the staff of Mid-Continent had a special relationship with her. In late in life, particularly after the Secret Service returned to the Truman's life after the Kennedy assassination, the Secret Service would drive the Truman's to Mid-Continent Public Library so that President and Mrs. Truman could pick out things for them to, to read. President Truman loved whodunits, but loved history and biography. And Mrs. Truman loved the same, but she especially loved history and especially loved whodunits. And they would take their armloads of books up to the circulation deck desk to check out. And the famous story was that one time Mrs. Truman had an armload of books, took them up to the desk that she did not have on her, her library card. She was embarrassed at this, but the young lady at the desk said, well, no worries, Mrs. Truman, we know who you are, and we will take care of this. And Mrs. Truman said, no, absolutely not. Rules are rules, and I am subject to the same rules as everybody, and I will go home and get my library card if you will just hold these books for me. So Mrs. Truman was taken home. She retrieved her library card, went back, and checked out her books. 
So Mrs. Truman felt that she should be subject to the very same rules as everybody. So the Truman family had a very deep love and respect for the library system. I wanted to offer to you a very special welcome from a very special guest speaker this afternoon. South 32. Well, it's good to be back home in what I call the center of the world, Independence, Missouri. I think it's the greatest town in the United States, and I've been all over the country and I've been to Europe and South America and several other places. But I still like to come back home, and I'll continue to feel that way as long as I live. And I think you find everybody in Independence feel the same way about this town because it's the center of things for most of us, and it's the center of things for me. And I'm more than happy to be here and to stay here for the rest of my life. I hope it won't cause you too much trouble while I'm here. And indeed, after Dwight Eisenhower was inaugurated as President of the United States on January 20th of 1953, Harry Truman became Mr. Citizen. That was a title that Margaret Truman bestowed on her father, and that title very much tickled him. And Harry Truman, for the first time, had to stop at a red light. And that was something else that very much tickled Harry Truman. After a luncheon at Dean Acheson's house, Harry Truman boarded a train and took that train back to Independence, Missouri. And along the way, he was stopped by many people shook a lot of hands. And then on the night of January 21st, 1953, was greeted by the people of Independence, Missouri, welcomed very warmly by the citizens there. And he was home and he was glad to be home. The next day, somebody asked him, what was the first thing you did when you got home to 219 North Delaware Street? And he said simply, I took the grips up to the attic, meeting his suitcases. Not long after that, a couple of big tractor trailer loads of what Truman called his goods and chattels, meeting their belongings, arrived at 219 North Delaware Street. And the Truman spent time putting all those goods and chattels and their belongings away inside of the home, including up in their attic and in a storage room up on the second floor. And they spent a lot of time unpacking. Now, in January of 1953, the family was adjusting to a new way of life. Now, one thing that we in Truman Land try to figure out is what exactly was the Truman's financial state as they were transitioning from being the first family to Mr. and Mrs. Citizen. Now, in Truman's second term as president of the United States, his salary was raised to $100,000, taxable. In addition, the president of the United States had an expense account and a travel budget. Now, being that in that second term, as you may remember, President Truman was living in Blair House because the White House was under renovation. So they didn't do a lot of entertaining and they didn't move back into the White House until near the end of that second term. So how much of that expense account they were able to unbank is they were able to bank is is really not known. But when Harry Truman left the presidency and became Mr. Citizen, there were two things that Truman lost immediately. One was that presidential salary. The other was Secret Service protection. So there was no pension for presidents at that time. Also, Truman did serve 10 years in the United States Senate, but there was no pension for that either. Now, what Truman did have was a pension for his United States Army service. 
So you might remember from our earlier sessions that Truman did serve in the Missouri National Guard, plus he did serve in World War I. But lesser known is that after Truman came home from serving in World War I, he did re-enlist and continued to serve in the reserves. Truman did not retire from the United States Army until after he left the White House. So ironically, from 1945 until 1953, President Harry S. Truman was his commander in chief, very ironically. So I wanted to share with you the president's tax returns or the first page of his tax returns. So you will see in his 1952 tax returns, his employer being the United States government and his local wages showing $100,000. But when you see the 1953 tax returns, you see that that has dropped quite precipitously. It reflects the little bit of that presidential salary from January 1st to January 20th, but then it drops precipitously. Harry Truman's army pension, when you break it down, comes out to just a little under $120 a month. That was the only real income that Harry Truman had. Now, how much Harry Truman was able to bank from 1945 to 1953 in the way of stocks and bonds and other investments is really interesting. So it's hard to pin down exactly how much Harry and Bess Wallace Truman were worth come January 20th of 1953. But here's what we do know that Harry Truman did have expenses as former president of the United States. He did open an office in Kansas City in the Federal Reserve Bank building. His brother, John Vivian Truman, negotiated a lease for that, that he had to pay. Truman did have a secretary, Rose Conway, who worked with him in the White House, continued to serve as his secretary, and he had another secretary who continued to handle all correspondence and such. Harry Truman had to pay those salaries out of his own pocket. All office expenses in terms of postage and such had to come out of his own pocket. And so all expenses related to being former president of the United States, those were coming out of his own pocket. So you can imagine that that started to add up. Now, that being said, you might remember last month near the end of the session, we talked about how Bess Wallace Truman's mother died in December of 1952. Technically speaking, 219 North Delaware Street, what we call the Truman home was technically Madge Gates Wallace's home, Harry Truman's mother-in-law. It was her house. When she died, Mother Wallace died without a will. She died in test state. Bess Wallace Truman's three brothers, Frank Wallace, George Wallace, and Fred Wallace, and their respective wives, May Wallace, Natalie Wallace, Christine Wallace, they all decided that Harry and Bess Wallace Truman should have 219 North Delaware Street because George and May, Frank and Natalie, Fred and Christine, they all had homes. And so Harry and Bess Wallace Truman bought 219 North Delaware Street for the equivalent, basically they bought out the house for about $19,000. Harry and Bess Wallace Truman also bought two new Chrysler cars. So we at least know 
that they had liquidity enough to buy 219 North Delaware Street, and they bought two new Chrysler automobiles. Now, that being said, when Mother Wallace died, her estate was probated at about $34,000. It was commonly said that Harry Truman married into a family that had money. That's really hard to say. But Mother Wallace, when she died, again, she died without a will, but her estate was valued at about $34,000. Now, I took that amount, and based on the Consumer Price Index, that came out at the end of last month to about $387,985 in today's money. Take that as you will. But as of the summer of 1953, 219 North Delaware Street legally became the Truman home for the very first time. And in the summer of 1953, for the very first time, Harry and Bess Wallace Truman lived in 219 North Delaware Street alone. They were empty nesters. On the road again. They just couldn't wait to get on the road again. Harry Truman loved to drive. He just absolutely loved to drive. So once they got their goods and chattels unpacked, they wanted to go and make a road trip. Now, Margaret Truman was living in New York. She was engaging in the singing career. She had a lovely singing voice. She was on the concert stage. She was doing radio and television spots. And they wanted to go see Margie in New York. So Harry and Bess Wallace Truman decided to make a trip east in Harry Truman's new Chrysler New Yorker. And they thought that they could make a trip east. Again, they had no Secret Service protection. They thought that they could drive incognito east. And so they mapped out a Plot to drive themselves first to Washington, D.C., and then make a trip to New York, and then drive back home. Well, it just didn't quite pan out the way they thought it would. I'd like to recommend another book, and many of you might have read this wonderful book by a very good good friend of the park, Matthew Algia's wonderful Harry Truman's Excellent Adventure. And I really hope someday a, a movie studio options this book for a wonderful film. There's no need to add any extra plot to this film because it is all there. This would make just a most wonderful film just the way that Mr. Algio wrote it. And it is just a wonderful book if you have never read it. And I wanted to share a little video clip that Mr. Algio has on his YouTube channel. When, the, when he was doing the publicity for his book, somebody came up to him and said, well, I know where that car is. And took him and showed him the car. I'd like to show you a little bit of the film clip. So this is the car from Harry Truman's excellent adventure. <laughs> I am behind the wheel of Harry's 1953 Chrysler New Yorker. And uh, this is where Harry sat when he did his trip and uh, best road shotgun. It uh, needs a little work, <laughs> but I'm sure, uh, I'm sure with a, a few hours of uh, restoration, you could get it back as good as new. I love it. It's got the radio here, uh, and I love this the speedometer, just that sort of the half circle and then the gauges. It really was a lovely car, and uh, it's a miracle that it exists in any form at all, really. We'll take a look at the outside. Look at this. <laughs> 
Hey, the wiring, what did he have? Holy cow, they had power windows. <laughs> is that what that is? Yeah. They had power windows. That's insane. Yes, and that vehicle had a Hemi to it, and it got probably about nine miles to the gallon, maybe nine, 10, 11 miles to the gallon. So that was a, an amazing vehicle. And as a Pennsylvanian, yes, it was true. Harry Truman got pulled over by a Pennsylvania state policeman. So imagine being that state policeman pulling over a former president of the United States, but policeman was doing his job. So yes, I, I, I highly recommend uh, Mr. Algio's book. And he just published last month a wonderful new book on Harry Truman and Pablo Picasso and the wonderful meeting of them. So I recommend his new book, When Harry Met Pablo, a wonderful read. <laughs> Can a former president of the United States be subpoenaed to testify to Congress? This came up shortly after Harry Truman became Mr. Citizen. And this came up in November of 1953. Harry Truman was subpoenaed to testify to the Committee of Un-American Activities and wanted to share with you a primary document. Harry Truman was subpoenaed to testify by Congressman Harold Velde of Illinois. Harry Truman thought not. And when Harry Truman replied to Congressman Valde, who was an attorney, again, from Illinois, Truman cited precedent, and Truman cited precedent by Washington and Jefferson, Monroe, Jackson, Tyler, Polk, Fillmore, Buchanan, Lincoln, Grant, Hayes, Cleveland, Theodore Roosevelt, Coolidge, Hoover, Franklin Roosevelt, and it's a very interesting precedent citing the se separation of powers in the United States Constitution. And of course, recent events have also brought this to light. And so perhaps in the chat box, I would ask you the, the same question. What do you think? Do you think a former president of the United States is subject to the subpoena power of the United States Congress. Do you agree with former President Truman? And of course, former presidents and current presidents may very well be subject to uh, subpoena power and they may very well agree or disagree with former President Truman. Harry Truman almost died. In 1954, he suffered a terrible gallbladder attack that was at first misdiagnosed as appendicitis. And I wanted to share with you the report from Dr. Wallace Graham, who had taken care of Harry Truman starting in 1945. Now, I don't know if any of you may be doctors or nurses, you may be able to make sense out of Dr. Graham's medical report there. Uh, I watched several episodes of St. Elsewhere in the ER in Chicago, Hope, and many other medical shows, but I still really can't transcribe that. But this was pretty serious. And this gallbladder attack and postoperative infection almost killed Harry Truman. But one of the things that really did I really think helped get Harry Truman through this were well wishes that Truman received from across the country. But what's really interesting in the Wallace Graham papers, which are available for you to see on the Truman Library's website and the National Archives website, are some very interesting, very interesting, we shall say, home remedies that Dr. Graham received, including one remedy that somebody sent to him, including one person who just called himself the angel, who said that all you need to give former President Truman is sugar, pure sugar, just feed him pure sugar, 
and it will clear everything that Harry Truman hates, pure sugar. Interesting. Uh, six years later, in 1960, now Harry Truman did have a serious bout of appendicitis while attending a play at Starlight Amphitheater here in Kansas City. Ironically, a play called Mr. President. He had to be rushed off the stage in an ambulance. So Harry Truman had some serious bouts with appendicitis and, and gallbladder in his post-presidency. Uh, have you read Harry Truman's memoirs? He was quite proud of them. It was a very interesting process. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see these with my background on, but there were a couple different editions of his memoirs. There were the, the basic edition of the memoirs that sold for about $1.75. Again, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see these with my background, but there was this boxed edition that were called the author's edition that were sold as well. I know that there is an ongoing issue related to former presidents and classified material. Now, it's no secret that many books are written using ghostwriters, and Harry Truman employed the use of researchers and ghostwriters. Now, when Truman was researching and writing his memoirs, he was in the Federal Reserve Building in Kansas City. And at one point, one of his ghostwriters was in his workspace and was reviewing materials. And he came across some materials that were labeled as classified and that particular individual did not have the clearance to proceed to view these materials. And so that individual went to President Truman's secretary, Rose Conway, who in turn went to former President Truman and said, what shall we do about this? President Truman called his former Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, and within hours, Secretary Acheson had some men from the Atomic Energy Commission fly to Kansas City with briefcases attached to their wrists with handcuffs, took that classified material with them, they flew right back to Washington, D.C. with that classified material. And according to how the story was relayed, all of this happened within the matter of hours. It's a really gripping story. And it, it, it's just an amazing story. I don't know how else to say it. Now, all that being said, one of the criticisms of Truman's memoirs that many have said was that Harry Truman was not well served by his researchers and his ghostwriters. And many of us sort of agree with our apologies to Harry Truman. And perhaps it's the use of the word memoirs. Harry Truman did not intend this to necessarily be an autobiography. He wanted it to be a history. And indeed, if you haven't read the memoirs, it begins with the events of April 12th of 1945 and how he learned that he was now president of the United States. And you have to get many, many pages in the first volume, which focuses on 1945, before you get anything autobiographical. Many critique the book saying that it doesn't have the voice of Harry Truman. That's why I would really recommend that you find the image that you see there. There is a relatively new, it came out about three years ago, the University of Missouri Press published a new 
edition of the memoirs of Harry S. Truman called a reader's edition that I think was brilliantly edited by a former associate director of the Harry S. Truman Presidential Library and Museum, Raymond Gesselbrecht. Not only is there a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful version of how and, and why the, the Truman Memoirs came to be, just a wonderful story about it. But Mr. Gesselbrecht, Dr. Gesselbrecht did a wonderful job of editing the memoirs, putting them in a wonderful, readable chron chronological order. And it reads just beautifully. So, so please allow a piece of advice. I know Midcontinent has several copies of this in, in the system. Find a copy, put it on hold. This, I think this is the definitive edition of the memoirs. So Truman had signed a pretty sizable deal from Doubleday and Time Life, both for the printed version of the memoirs and for the serialized rights of the memoirs that would appear in Life magazine. But after the tax rate and after the expenses of paying all of the expenses, the ghost writers, the researchers and such, according to him and according to what we see on the tax returns and according to his daughter, Margaret Truman Daniel, he received about $37,000 out of about a $600,000 deal. Now, $37,000 in their world in the 1955, 1957, 58 time period, that's still a significant amount of money. But out of a $600,000 deal, really wasn't. But that being said, the memoirs of Harry S. Truman, both the original version and then the, the newly edited reader's edition, very valuable tools for us today. So any version of the memoirs, very valuable. In April of 1956, Harry Truman became a father-in-law. Margaret Truman married E. Clifton Daniel. <laughs> At Independence, Missouri, Harry Truman's hometown, his daughter Margaret marries 43-year-old Clifton Daniel of the New York Times. The wedding is at the same red brick church where 37 years ago the man who became President of the United States was married. The bride wears a street-length dress of beige Venetian lace. From the church, the newlyweds drive to the Truman home, pausing with the four parents to meet the cameras. Ex-President Harry Truman and his family still prefer a quiet hometown life. So this wedding is in the family tradition. And Mary Margaret Truman, Margaret Truman Daniel made such a beautiful bride. And we at the Truman home, we love that film. We love that photograph because that gives us some clues as to what that house looked like on April 21st, 1956, in terms of the wallpapering on the walls. You notice the hat on the hat rack. And because they rarely ever, rarely ever let cameras, motion picture cameras, still cameras, they rarely ever let cameras inside of that house it does give us that rare insight. So the next year, Margaret and Clifton Daniel gave birth to their first son, Clifton Truman Daniel, and eventually Clifton and Margaret Truman Daniel had four sons, and Harry and Bess Wallace Truman became very proud grandparents as well. One of the other things that Harry S. Truman wanted to do was build a presidential library, but where? Where would he build his presidential library? One of the reasons he wanted to do that was he knew that his predecessors, many of his predecessors' papers were scattered all over the place. He also knew that some of his predecessors' papers were destroyed. 
He knew that Robert Todd Lincoln destroyed, for example, the correspondence of his parents, Abraham and Mary Lincoln. He knew that Chester Allen Arthur ordered the destruction of his presidential papers. Harry Truman wanted to set a precedent by centralizing the papers of his administration. He wanted to create a place where the citizenry could come and study, not him, but the government. He was very civics-minded. He wanted a place where especially young people could come and learn how government worked. He had a vision of placing it on his maternal grandparents' farm. He and his sister, Mary Jane, and his brother, John Vivian, still owned the 600-acre farm in Grandview. And he had visions of building it there. And so near the end of his presidency, he had some architects and engineers come down and start looking at that property. And then early in his post-presidency, as you see in that photograph there, they visited parts of his maternal grandparents' farm, and they tried to figure out where would be the best place to place this repository. There's a great story that some of the architects and engineers were meeting with the president's brother, John Vivian, who was still with some of his sons farming parts of the Solomon and Harriet Louisa Young farm in Grandview. And they were surveying part, probably near the west part of the farm, near the train tracks, because they were thinking access. Remember, not, a, not many of the modern roads that we think of modern Grandview were there yet. And so that's what the architects and engineers were thinking about. And it's a still prime farmland. And at one point, the story goes, John Vivian was getting rather exasperated and threw his hat down on the ground and said, this is too good a farmland to build any old danged library. And part of the problem may have been that this was all theoretical because nobody had really done anything like this yet. The Franklin Delano Roosevelt Library was being developed, but what Truman was envisioning was still theoretical. One of the other things that Harry Truman wanted to do was rebuild his grandfather Solomon Young's home that had burned down not long after Solomon Young died in 1892. Thankfully, Harry Truman remembered what his grandfather's house looked like. You might remember this from one of our first sessions of this program series. So as Truman was envisioning this, he drew from memory the sketches that I'm sharing with you right now. And he sent these drawings to these architects and engineers. And so these drawings are of Harry Truman's hand. These are the only images that we have of what the Solomon and Harriet Louisa Young original farmhouse may have looked like on the Grandview farm. So this is how Harry Truman remembered the original farmhouse looking like from the front. And this is how Harry Truman remembered the first floor of the interior looking like. This is it. Now, the question is, I think, interestingly, again, my only my perspective, are we remembering this is how Harry Truman remembered it as a young boy or how Harry Truman is remembering it from the early 1950s? Who knows? But this is how Harry Truman was remembering it. Now, there are a couple of things that may have stopped this process. 
one, it may have been that Harry Truman might not have been of the financial means to have rebuilt it, to have rebuilt this house. At the time, as is the case right now, building of a presidential library has to be of part a president's personal financial resources and of popular subscription. In this case, Harry Truman would have had to foot the bill for this house and then the library of popular subscription and then the deed handed over to the federal government. But then to the city of independence made Harry Truman an offer that he couldn't refuse. They offered him a prime piece of real estate not far from 219 North Delaware Street, not far from the home, where he could either walk to work in just a few minutes, about a two and a half minute drive, and a property that would serve as a central part of an economic revitalization program. And Truman accepted that piece. And so Harry Truman went to work, started to raise the money, and about $1.7 million later, in July of 1957, the Truman Library was dedicated. I wanted to share with you not only this invitation, James F. Swoyer Jr., that is the husband of Harry Truman's niece, Martha Ann Swoyer. And here is a newsreel from the dedication of the Truman Library in 1957. In Independence, Missouri, the Harry S. Truman Library becomes a reality, fulfilling a long-cherished dream of the ex-president and noted amateur historian. A crowd of 10,000 witnesses the Masonic rites of dedication. Mr. Truman and Chief Justice Warren, both past masters of the order, take part in the ritual. The structure was built by popular subscription. Among those attending, in addition to Mrs. Truman, was Mrs. Franklin D. Roosevelt, and political leaders of both parties. Republican Senate leader Noland was one of the onlookers, as President Eisenhower's representative received the deed on behalf of the government. Our only living former presidents, Hoover and Truman, met for congratulations that typified the nonpartisan spirit of the day. The Truman Library houses three and a half million documents, the records of a seven-year term of office that comprise an invaluable research center. The meadows of that eventful era make up an historical museum which, in large part, speaks for itself. For instance, this souvenir of Truman's 1948 election victory. The private archives of Harry S. Truman, a gift to America. And tens of millions of people since have visited the Truman Library. But it did come at the expense of some in the community as part of that economic development and urban renewal in the area that is known today as McCoy Park. That was once a community that was known as the Neck. As part of that economic revitalization, as part of urban renewal, at least 179 families were displaced and removed. Many of those families, African-American families, lost their homes. And many of them were not willing, but were, were not willingly removed from that property. And to this day, many of those families are still very hurt about having to leave that area. And so today, as you drive through what is now known as McCoy Park, that area between the Truman Library and the Independence Square, there are still some very hurt feelings over that. And so that's uh, a very difficult part of independence history that needs to be remembered. In 1958, Congress finally provided a presidential pension at $25,000 per year taxable plus office expenses, but still no secret service protection. 
and Herbert Hoover, who was independently wealthy, but accepted it not to embarrass Harry Truman and Harry Truman, who were the only living former presidents at that time, immediately started receiving those benefits. And you started seeing that reflected on Truman's 1959 tax return. Truman had told the Speaker of the House, John McCormick, earlier that if it weren't for the selling of some of the farm in Grandview, that Truman would be practically on relief. And so thankfully, at least in Truman's eyes, Congress did finally pass the Presidential Pension Act. So all the way with John F. Kennedy or not, Truman withdrew as a delegate from the 1960 presidential Democratic primary and presidential delegation. But you'd like to hear part of why Truman did so. As you already know, I have resigned as a delegate from Missouri to the Democratic National Convention. I did this because I have no desire whatever to be a party to proceedings that are taking on the aspects of a prearranged affair. A convention which is controlled in advance by one group and its candidates leaves the delegates no opportunity for a democratic choice and reduces the convention to a mockery. I've always believed that the Democratic Party should stand for an open convention and should resist any bandwagon that thwarts or stifles the free and deliberate proce deliberative process of this great instrument of democracy. Don't mind that happening in the Republican Convention, you understand? <laughs> the Democratic Party must never be allowed to become a party of privilege for a man of modest means, or no means at all, cannot rise to a service in the nation. I'm speaking up at this time because I would hope that many of the delegates who have been stampeded or pressured into pre-convention commitments against their better judgment. And I know at first hand of such instances, I hope those delegates will have a chance to exercise further judgment. But eventually Truman did come around, supported John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson, and of course JFK very narrowly won the 1960 presidential election. Harry Truman was the first official guest welcome to the White House in January of 1961. And in November of 1961, Harry Truman returned to the White House and a piano player returned to the White House. And I was thinking about this the other night. I think, I think this was the very first picture of Harry Truman that I ever saw. And this is in the White House, and you see President Kennedy sitting there, and you see Bess Wallace Truman sitting there. And right above the president's head, you'll see Jacqueline Kennedy, and then to her left, Lyndon Johnson. But I absolutely love this photograph, and President Truman sitting at the piano. I absolutely love this photograph. And I think this is the very first photograph of President Truman that I ever saw all those years ago. November 22nd of 1963, Harry Truman was at the Muehlbach Hotel where he heard the news of what had happened in Dallas. And I wanted to share with you just a few film clips of what Harry Truman had to say. Oh, well, I was uh, very much uh, shocked and hurt when I heard of the passing of the President of the United States. He was a good man, an able president, and he did a good job. And it's too bad that those things have to happen, particularly by some good-for-nothing fellow who didn't have anything else to do but to uh, try to take the head of the state away from us. But uh, we have to make those things. It's been done time, uh, time and again before. It was attempted one time when I remember it very well but it didn't succeed. I imagine Will this you reminds you of Mr. a time Johnson? 20 years ago. Uh, how can you uh, ad advise Mr. Johnson? Uh, as compared to Mr. Johnson needs any advice. He'll ask me for it. He's the President of the United States. 
Okay. The man doesn't volunteer uh, information to the president unless he asks for it. Too many of you did that to me, and I didn't pay any attention to you. Have you been asked to call on the president now? I have not. Have you talked to President Johnson since yes, he's taken I office? I have. I've talked to him. Could you tell us something about the conversation? No, I will not, because that's confidential. You ask the president if you want to find out. What are your plans something. right now, sir? Go to the hotel and sit down if I can. In Independence, Missouri, former President Harry S. Truman went to the Truman Presidential Library early this morning to prepare for the flight to Washington to pay his respects to President John F. Kennedy. At the library, the former president read a statement and answered a few questions. I am shocked and beyond words at the tragedy that has happened to our country and to President Kennedy, Kennedy's family today. The president's death is a great personal loss to the country and to me. He was an able president, one the people loved and trusted. Mrs. Truman and I send our deepest sympathy to Mrs. Kennedy and the Kennedy family. Harry S. Truman. Mr. President, uh, do you have any words for the American people? Not yet. Do you plan to go to Washington, sir? Uh, I'm planning to go to Washington either this afternoon or first thing in the morning. As soon as I find out what the arrangements are, they phoned me that they had a plane ready for me. Do you then, sir, fully realize the weight of the responsibility that President Johnson faces today, the suddenness of it? Uh, would you care to comment? He's perfectly capable of carrying out the job. No worry about him. The former president boarded an Air Force jet at 11.25 a.m. Central Standard Time for the flight to Washington. He's due to arrive in the Capitol shortly after 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. This is... Oh, well, I was... In November 25th, 1963, leaving St. Matthew's Cathedral, former President Truman, Margaret Truman Daniel, Dwight Eisenhower, Attorney General Robert Kennedy. Mrs. Truman did not make the trip to the funeral. If there's anything good that came out of, of this event is that after the, the funeral, former President Truman, former President Eisenhower, they sat, they spent some time together and this feud that had developed over time between the two of them melted away and their friendship resumed. In October of 1964, October 13th, to be exact, in the upstairs bedroom of 219 North Delaware Street, former President Truman was stepping into that bathroom and somehow he lost his footing. He slipped and he fell. He hit his head and then hit his ribs on the bathtub. So he suffered a, a, a major contusion and then cracked some ribs. He was taken to Research Hospital and admitted and was there for several days. This was significant because earlier that year, former President Truman turned 80 years old. It was after this accident that many of us think that former President Truman physically started his physical decline. And many of us really think former President Truman never fully recovered from this particular accident, unfortunately. Yep. Now, if any of you in our group today happen to have your Medicare cards out, or have them with you 
if you have Medicare, I, I would like to invite you to take them out with pride and wave them in honor of the daddy of Medicare. The final Medicare and Medicaid bill passed both houses of Congress by an overwhelming vote. President Johnson signed the bill making it the law of the land July 30th, 1965 in Independence, Missouri, in the presence of former President Truman. Later, President Johnson helped President Truman sign up for the voluntary part of Medicare. They told me, President Truman, that if you wish to get the voluntary medical insurance, that you'll have to sign this application form. And they asked me to sign as your witness. So you're getting special treatment since cards won't go out to the other folks until the end of this month. But we wanted you to know, and we wanted the entire world to know, that we haven't forgotten who is the real daddy of Medicare. And indeed, in a really last-minute decision, President Lyndon Johnson decided to change the signing ceremony from Washington, D.C. to Independence. The and then a few months after that signing ceremony, Lyndon Johnson came back and presented the Medicare cards, number one and two, to Harry Truman. And then Medicare had a new spokesman for the new Medicare law. One of the proudest moments since leaving the White House occurred when President Johnson came to this library in Independence on July 30th so that I could witness the signing of the Medicare bill into law. An equally proud moment took place at the announcement of the establishment of the Center for the Advancement of Peace on January the 20th of this year, when President Johnson again visited the library and personally presented me and Mrs. Truman with number one and number two Medicare registration cards. Time will prove the Medicare program for our senior citizens is a great step forward in meeting one of the most critical needs that confront most of our elder citizens. For many, it is a step from charity to security and dignity. Now you have until May 31st to enroll for Medicare medical insurance. See your Social Security office. And indeed, after the death of Bess Wallace Truman in 1982, as National Park Service employees were cataloging and trying to figure out all of what was in the house under the blotter of the upstairs desk in 219 North Delaware Street, were found Medicare cards numbers one and two. And so one of the great honors of what we do on behalf of you, the American people, is we preserve Medicare cards A and B, numbers one and two. In 1969, in March, Harry S. Truman received a visit from a surprising guest, a former arch enemy, Richard Nixon. And so another hatchet was buried. Wanted to share this film clip with you. Before Mr. President, this is school children. I just finished a trip to Europe. I met with the leaders of the great nations of Europe, and all of us were talking about the 20th anniversary of NATO, which will be celebrated in April in Washington. Uh, we hope you can come with Mrs. Truman. But I want to say that uh, looking back to that day when uh, NATO came to be, uh, when I was a freshman congressman, you were president of the United States. Uh, I. Uh, and proud of the fact that along with many other Republicans, I supported the Marshall Plan, the Green Turkish Aid Program. But particularly, I think, 
it is important to point out that uh, without your leadership of the United States and the free world at that time, uh, setting up this great alliance, we would not have had the strength which has avoided a world war since that time. I have a very special privilege and honor today, and that is to present to uh, President Truman uh, the piano uh, that uh, he used when he was in the White House during the years he was in Washington. To show you the uh, special affection he had for this instrument, and I have checked it this way, I find that uh, it was one of the few pieces of furniture that he moved from the White House to Blair House and had it in Blair House while the White House was being renovated. And it seemed to me that since, uh, in addition to many other uh, great contributions to the nation President Truman has made, that he is certainly the most distinguished and, and accomplished pianist that his piano from the White House ought to be in his library. And here it is, Mr. President. Appreciate it. Very, very, very much. Aren't well, I, I'll play something for the president. <laughs> <laughs> I play everything in the key of G, my ear. Let me try it out. You could tell President Truman wasn't looking well. It was one of the last times that he was at his, his beloved presidential library. Truman was in and out of research hospital many times over the next few years. On December 5th of 1972, he was taken from 219 North Delaware Street for the final time. It was called bronchitis. Every day, he was given a status report by doctors. His daughter, Margaret Truman Daniel, came in from New York. She had started a publicity blitz because she was about to publish a biography of her father called Harry S. Truman, which many of you may have read. It's a book that I very much recommend. It's not just a celebrity biography of her father. It's it's a, a wonderful, wonderful biography of her father that really shouldn't be overlooked. But Margaret Truman Daniel came to Independence in Kansas City to be with her father and be with her mother. And eventually, Margaret Truman Daniel gave press updates on her father. He had his good days and his bad days. And eventually, as it got closer to Christmas, he took a turn for the worse. He could only take nourishment through a nasal tube. His sister, Mary Jane Truman, ironically, was in the hospital as well for a hip fracture. She had fallen around Thanksgiving in, in November. She was brought into the room to be with her brother. On Christmas Eve, Mrs. Truman was in the room. And then because she was so tired, Margaret Truman Daniel took her home for her to get some rest. On Christmas morning, December 26th, 1972, at 7.50 a.m., December 26th, 1972, 7.50 a.m., Harry S. Truman died at the age of 88 years old. The CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite and Robert Barr in Kansas City, Missouri, Ike Pappas in Independence, Missouri, Charles Kuralt in Independence, Neil Strausser in Washington, and George Natanson in Managua, Nicaragua. Good evening. Former President Harry S. Truman died this morning at age 88. The long vigil at Kansas City's research hospital came to an end when hospital spokesman Wayne Connery made the announcement. The Honorable Harry S. Truman, 33rd President of the United States, died at 7.50 a.m. at Research Hospital and Medical Center.
They waited patiently for the presidential proclamation of mourning before lowering the flag outside Kansas City's research hospital. It was done calmly and with dignity, very much in keeping with the former president's last hours here. He was in a deep coma then, his body swiftly giving way. For three weeks, he had fought off the effects of advancing age and a weakened heart, even when the drugs were no longer working. He went quickly this morning, a hospital source said, but peacefully. Harry Truman's neighbors on North Delaware Street Independence did not wait for a presidential proclamation to honor their neighbor. When word of the end came, they quietly lowered their flags to half-staff and then took a moment to remember what they liked best about him. I think his friendliness. I mean, how often do you have this close a connection to somebody of this integrity and have him always willing to speak to you and to stop and talk to you and uh, make you feel like as if he knew you? This is the thing that sticks in my mind more than anything else. What do you think is the reaction of your neighbors in Independence? Well, I can't speak for my neighbors, but you can see the flags that are flying on the homes of the neighbors are half-masked. I think this says it. They're really quite sorry, I'm sure. I know we all feel like we've lost a good friend. The flag was also lowered this morning at number 219 North Delaware, the Truman residence. A lone Secret Service man stood guard on the lawn. As within, Mr. Truman's wife, Bess, the childhood sweetheart he married 53 years ago, mourned. She had suffered with him through the long hours and days of the hospital vigil, and she was tired. Late this afternoon, Mrs. Truman, accompanied by her daughter, Mrs. Margaret Truman Daniel, and her husband, left to go to Carson's funeral home, where the former president's body was now prepared for repose. There was little else stirring today from the house on North Delaware. Mike Pappas, CBS News, Independence. The funeral observances will last for two days, but without the pomp and fanfare usually accorded to great statesmen, this was the request of Mr. Truman himself. Tomorrow, the body will go by motorcade from the Carson Funeral Home in Independence to the Truman Library and will lie in state there for 24 hours. Thursday, after funeral services in the library's auditorium, Mr. Truman will be buried on the library grounds in a quiet and private ceremony. President Nixon does not plan to attend the funeral, but he and Mrs. Nixon will fly to Independence tomorrow for a wreath-laying ceremony at the library. A few years earlier, when Harry Truman was working with the United States Army to prepare his funeral, a formal plan that was known as O Plan Missouri, a very serious operation. It was very somber in the room, and Truman had to give his formal approval to the plan. It was so serious that you could hear a pin drop in the room. Truman sensed that, and he gave his approval to the plan. And he sensed the somberness in the room, and he said he gave the approval to the plan. And he said, sort of a shame I'm going to have to miss it. The CBS Evening... December 28th, 1972, the funeral at the Truman Library. When it was all over, the flag was presented on behalf of a grateful nation to Bess Wallace Truman. And red carnations, his favorite flower, were placed on a Marcellus casket, Mrs. Truman's final gift to Harry S. Truman. Bess Wallace Truman joined him 10 years later. She died in October of 1982. She lived to be 97 years old. My dear friends, you are now graduates of Truman. I congratulate you. And I thank you for being with us for the last 10 months. I thank Mid-Continent Public Library for allowing me to do this. This is the third time that I've done a program series like this. It allows me to refresh myself and dive into these materials. And that means a lot to me. It means a lot to be asked. And it really means a lot that people dial in and join us for programs like this.
And so I thank you, Midcontinent, and I thank all of you for joining us on this guided tour of Truman. If you have any questions, anything in the chat? I'm sorry I ran a little bit over, but there were some videos that I did want to share with you today. Yes, we so appreciate you all joining in. It's been such a wonderful journey. Um, the program will be archived, so you should still have access to the videos. And once the link is uploaded for this final session, I will send that out as well. So yes, thank you all so much. It has been a joy. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Doug, truly. You're a wealth of knowledge and we so benefit from that. So thank you. That's very kind, very kind. Thank you. That looks so like wherever you go today, thank you all so much. Be safe. Have a very safe and happy holiday season. Looks like Alicia asks, what's next, Doug? <laughs> any ideas if 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 anybody has any ideas for any types of programs like this, please let Beth or me know, and we would love to hear them. All right. Well, if there's no further questions, we will sign off one final time for the Truman program. Thank you all so much. Uh, take care, my friends.